Hello and welcome to the Lost Art Podcast. I'm Garen, I'm here with Paul. How are you today? And this week, uh, I'm all right, I'm all right. I, just, <laughs> I was jumping straight into it. i tell you what's been going on. Absolutely nothing. Uh, same as yeah. everyone else on Earth. Like, we'd be lying if we were just inventing things to talk about. Like, what, like what's it? yesterday I burnt my toast, but the day before I got it just right. Yeah, it's just, right. that's the problem, isn't it? It's just, okay. like, the most mundane show is, like, even last night, I've done, done radio last night solo, and it's like, it's like pulling teeth. I'm like, what do I talk about? I talked about the fact that there's loads of dog shit in the path down, down my road. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, because I, I haven't experienced anything else. I saw a swan the other day. Uh, that was grand. Like, you know what I mean? Like, there's, there's nothing to talk about, those, really. One of those muscly swans, was it? Or slender? Uh, it was a pair of them. It was a pair of them. One big kind of hench one and one slender one. I couldn't believe as a kid when someone says, they can break your arm. I was like, damn it. Like, maybe I don't a know. kid arm. Maybe. Like, no, like a regular arm. Like, damn it. Maybe. I don't know. I, I mean, they're big and they're powerful. I reckon but, that's some. That's like a groundskeeper to start that room. Of course, so you wouldn't stay be away, fucking man. with the swans. Of course, don't be fucking with. Don't be fucking with any animal. Leave them all alone. But like swans in particular, they you know um sometimes we go down and feed the swans, and if, if they're kind of hungry, they go with you a little bit hard. You know, you have whatever like a biscuit or bread or whatever the fuck. You know, sometimes bring crackers or something down, and the inside their beaks is kind of serrated. They're kind of spiky inside yeah. their beaks, so they can, they can get you. You know, like yeah. it's, it's not it's not the most pleasant feeling. And just the first time um, we ever opened the podcast up, up talking about swans. I never thought I'd do and that. Not, not the band swans either. Not the band swans. I did. I was in a band with a fella whose mother and father were chefs at Windsor Castle, who apparently the Queen is the only person in uh, in England who's allowed to eat swans. And does she? Uh, I doubt it. But apparently oh. swans are like considered the Queen's fowl. Like they're for her right. only. And uh, if you ever got caught eating a swan, that's you straight to jail, straight to London Tower with the ravens or whatever. <laughs> uh, but yeah, his his man dad worked as uh, as chefs. They worked in the kitchen at Windsor, and he was telling me that yeah, they they the only ones with a license to like prepare fowl because the uh, prefer prepare swans they because the, the royal family can eat them. Yeah, off you go. <laughs> Do you want to tell people what we are talking about today? Yes, we are. Uh, revisiting a topic kind of so our most popular podcast that we've ever done by a large margin is one that we never thought would be uh very popular at all and it was 80s hip-hop so mm. uh, our 80s hip-hop one done bananas numbers like double our other best ones uh so us being popularity hearers decided to uh, beat, that, beat that thing with a stick. And today well, we're going I to... I don't know. I don't know. Like, it's a good <laughs> sequel. It's a year, decade later and we're exactly. doing it over a year later. I think we're all right. Exactly. I think we're all right. It's also a, a, a topic in the genre that's very close to our heart. Um, mm. It's something that I consider to be probably the great... One of the greatest runs in musical history. And that oh, yeah. is 90s hip-hop. 90s. So people hip-hop. Ask, a few people asking for this episode as well, yeah, so it was yeah. about time we did it. Um, it. The only problem with this was how hard it was. To oh, rough. We even, we even broke our new rule because we said we were going six songs each to five songs each. And for this one, we were like, no, we have to do six. Like, yeah. And even that's doing it a gross disservice. The, Absolutely. The, it should be 30 songs each minimum on this thing. So we probably will do a volume two, realistically. Yeah, yeah. and a lot of these are quite obvious choices, but yeah. we had to do the obvious ones earlier on because someone go, I can't believe they did yeah. best of ninety seven. <laughs> First of all, it's not called best of ninety seven yeah. anyway. Yes, uh, but it, it, look, it, it's we always do this with our we get we get the big major ones out of the way, but we throw in our few favorites. There's a couple there for me that wouldn't be on other people's lists. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely, one hundred percent. And again, these are just examples of killer tracks from the nineties that are yeah. hip hop. That's not to say that like in a lot of these cases, I'm looking through this here and every single song on the albums that these are off are killers could be, could be on. Yeah. This I know. I noticed that uh, three of mine are not even singles. Oh yeah. Same. So yeah. There you go. Yeah. Batch it, man. <laughs> anyway, let's get, let's get the fucking sharpened swords out here now and start swinging them. Who is your first one? My first one, I put in my 1990 entry. So we're kicking off right at the turn of the decade, mm. uh, and we're coming from New York. It's Tribe Called Quest. Can I kick it? Because it's 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 one of the best rap songs of all time. Not just yeah. the nineties, yeah. and it's one of the best songs of all time. Yeah. So not just rap. Um, this song is based around a sample from Lil Reed's "Walk of the Wild Side." Uh, Five Dog said that the, this is mad. Five Dog said that the group has never received any royalties from this song because because of the Lil Reed sample, Oof. and. He said that uh, he's. They're, they're very surprised that Lou Reed never offered them a penny. 
That's mine. Like, you know, after, an hour, after, after a while gone, you know what? Uh, th- this is quite a, a, an important song in hip-hop. Yeah. And I'm taking 100%, despite the fact that there's, uh, like, Ian Jury and the Blockhead yeah. samples in Yeah. Oh, a very interesting sample in it. With the Er You Can was from Spotty from Super Ted. Really? Yeah, who's uh, done by uh, John Pertwee, who did Wurzel Gummidge. Uh, yeah. No one's surprised to find out that uh, Spotty is the same as Wurzel Gummidge. It's pretty much the same voice. Mm. And uh, Doctor, Who, Doctor Who, of course, or Doctor Why, or Why the Hell Would You Watch That? And that's a terrible <laughs> TV show. Unlike Wurzel Gummidge and uh, Super Ted. That's savage. Yeah, yeah uh, it's mad. Um, so their debut album, People's Instinctive Travels and the Paths of Rhythm, mm. spearheaded this kind of alternative hip-hop that had like a different approach to writing lyrics, mm. and different themes, and even different approach to, pro- uh, approach to production. But I think, if I'm not mistaken, some maybe more instruments in there. I could Definitely. be wrong about that. Definitely, think, yeah. yeah. Um, and they were singing about liking a girl rather than impregnating a girl. I'm not yes. saying that the other ones yes. are bad because yeah. of that. Yeah. We're going to get into the best music after this as well. Mm. And it's all mad, horrible shit as mm. well. But this was, they had no fear. They were so good. It's like, you know what it's like? You know those comedians that are so good that they don't even, like Seinfeld. Yeah, it doesn't he, have the course. Like, doesn't have the course. It doesn't have mm. to talk about mad, horrible shit. He's just so solid and tight that it doesn't mean it. I'm not saying it's good or bad to be either. It's just, sometimes you can be so good where you're like, look, I'm going to come across a different approach. Now, I don't know what they were like personally. I know that they had, from watching the documentary, which is incredible. Great documentary interband kind of egos yeah but i don't know if they ever had a pop out other bands from singing about that kind of stuff but they just did their own thing yeah very, they, they were kind of um, involved in the whole kind of brand newbie and scene as well so there was very much a, a black empowerment through music thing happening and troy were certainly riding the crest of it like yeah. Um, they they seen all the stuff like NWA and they were like that's deadly and all I like it but that's not what we're about like we're not that's, yeah. we want to wear the, the stripy fucking weird tea cozy hats and wear brown like all of them just wore yeah, it's brown a, it's clothes a, all the time a lot, it's a lot it's based on sort of like a mix between military clothing and African uh, yeah. like sort of gear and it's uh, yeah it was it reminded me of like that time when Spike Lee was knocking out savage films yes and, there was this sort of, well, you have to remember that this is before Gangster Rap anyway. Exactly, yeah. But it's all, well, well, it's, all, but it's, also, it's also after people were already singing, rapping about some dark shit anyway. Oh, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Pretty mad, like, streets and stuff. But look, I love it. It's not, it's not a typical New York sound, but they're not a typical artists from New York. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so I'm going to go with them as my first. Like, we're, I'm just let you know we're not playing samples today because... yeah. We have a feeling this one. If 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 it's as popular as the other one, if it's not, whatever. Yeah. But we'd be uh, we'd be shut down if we played some, oh, this, especially because there are samples within samples within samples. So exactly. No, uh, I don't want another letter off Doctor Dre. <laughs> um. yeah. That was my first one. Who's your first one? <laughs> uh, my first one is Cypress Hill, and I'm going with the song. I ain't going out like that. I didn't want to do and saying in the membrane or anything like that. It's yeah, well, I ain't going out like that. Better. It's the best song on the album, I think. Um, yeah. It's the best song on Black Sunday, which came out in 1993. Uh, triple platinum, sold 3.4 million copies today, um, which is still a lot for like hip hop now. What what um, people need to understand is that hip hop hip hop now in the 2010s, whatever the f- what bleed 2021, kind of from 2000 onwards, hip hop was essentially pop, and it, 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 yeah, it's it's a mainstream. Weird. Huh? It got kind of weird. It did get weird, but it's it's a mainstream thing now. But in the nineties, it was still kind of underground. Like the and like the, yeah. to sell that amount of records was a big deal. A big deal. Yeah, it annoyed people. That's how you know it was popular. Exactly, it a lot of people. Um, I think we, we might have mentioned it before that their first album, Cypress Hill, Cypress Hill, was still in the charts when this came out. So they became the first hip-hop group ever to have two albums in the top 10 at the same time. Yeah. 
Um, was it just released that fast, or was the other one just like a slow burner? The, the other one, the other one was still in the rounds. The other one came out in like nineteen ninety, the end of nineteen ninety one, maybe if I remember correctly. I could be, I could be off on that. Um, and the lads were like straight back in the studio, not just, resting on the laurels. Yeah, let's just knock <laughs> uh, one of the greatest hip hop albums, literally of all time, in Black Sunday. Yeah. That sounds like, unlike anything else. There anything is nothing. Else, yeah. There's nothing, and they could never recreate it. They tried. Um, you, you go and you pick up like Stone Raiders or Four or Temple's Boom or anything like that. Like the songs on Temple Boom that's that kind of have that feel. There's um songs on Four like Checkmate on Four has that Cypress Hill feel, but yeah. they start messing with that Doctor Green Tom style shit and it's, <laughs> it's they never got it back. Even you go back to Cypress Hill, Cypress Hill, even with like um how we could just kill a man. It's kind of there, but it's not honed. Black Sunday yeah. just had it it had it i remember hearing it the year it came out 1993 i was 12 years of age and i'd all, already liked hip-hop but i didn't know anything about hip-hop you know i was still listening to like vanilla ice and shit like that and i heard this yeah. um insane the brain came out and i was like what the name of jesus is that obviously ran out bought, bought the tape brought it home put it in i was like are you for real like are you f- that's crazy um, this is the future this is the future <laughs> and it wasn't the future it was just a blip unfortunately yeah. uh, Cypress Hill still put out great stuff but none of it was Black Sunday you know they yeah. just never they never got back there they got back there as I said in songs but not in albums uh, they never made an album as good as this uh, so they formed in South Gay, California in 1987 uh, this is their toured single uh, released off Black Sunday they actually got banned off Saturday Night Live <laughs> uh, while playing this they, they, they went on to play it and uh, DJ Moogs lit up a joint live on air mm-hmm. as they were as they were starting to play. So SNL cut them off, um, cut them off like halfway through the song. Killed them never, got, never got back on. Never got back on. Uh, no matter how no. big they got, it didn't matter. Yeah. Uh, there's a sample from Black Sabbath, The Wizard, on there. Um, oh, yeah. um, so uh, Black Sabbath have songwriting credits on it as well. They obviously exercise their rights to, to make a few bob off it. So if you go in and you look at the producers credits and songwriters credits like they're all listed geezer butler they're all listed in there as a um produced by a guy called todd ray uh, who's known as t ray um in the production business and he got famous doing uh, the judgment night soundtrack he was a producer on loads of songs for the judgment night soundtrack oh. so after that he got invited to work with a load of hip-hop artists and a load of rock artists so he went off and he done funk dubious he done albums for helmet cool g rap dilated peoples he done album for santana White Zombie, Corn, uh, done a lot of that kind of stuff. That's how he made us, uh, made us his few quid and got his oh, name right. out there. Was off the Judgment Night soundtrack, which I actually must go back and watch that movie. I remember the movie being bad, but not like that bad. It's one of those ones where the soundtrack just eclipsed the. Computer. Yeah, the soundtrack was so good. Jesus Christ, it's so good. Mm. Um, but that would have been before. Was that, that was pre the Crow? Was it? Was Judgment Night pre the Crow? Uh, it's got to be a couple of years before, if not. Yeah, I think it is. A could be the year after. I think it's I think it's before the crow. I'm pretty sure. I'll tell you what, I'll do it live. Live on air I'm gonna look oh, you up keep now. talking, you keep talking, I'll do it. You got it? All right. Yeah, yeah, so this guy, yeah, Todd Ray, T Ray, he was known for doing that and a lot of the hip hop bands, Cypress Hill included, were so impressed with the way he worked and the the kind of ideas he had for production that uh, loads of them avoided him to jump on board and uh, he kind of got a name for for being a hip hop producer for a, for a long time. Yeah. Right. Is there the six months between them and six months. first yeah. yeah. I had a feeling um because that's the first one I remembered having those kind of crossovers. Now if there's if there's only six months between them that means they were realistically happening concurrently. So Absolutely, yeah. Uh, I don't. It's, I, it's, it's, it's always movies. Well, to be fair, I really like the crowd film. Oh yeah, you just shouldn't watch it too much. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah you, you lose it. But that's yeah. it's still a better soundtrack than the movie. Just a bit. Judgment yeah. Night massively, and then Spawn is in a different uh, league altogether. <laughs> so bad. There's a new Spawn movie <laughs> supposedly due out in the next year. Yeah, and um, Todd McFarlane, the inventor of Spawn, announced about six, seven years ago. He's like, "Oh, we're making a Spawn movie that's rated R," and uh, it's sure. it's. It's uh, I'm writing and directing it, and everybody went, "What?" Because he, 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 that's not his job. Like he does comics, he can't make films. And they were like, "How are you going to get around the budget and all?" Because he said that they're going to self finance it. I'm like, "How the hell are you going to self finance a Spawn movie?" Like, yeah. And he said, "Oh, Spawn's not really going to be in it." And we were like, "What?" 
Oh, okay. So he's like, yeah, we're just going to use him like like the boogeyman. You know, it's going to be all about Sam and Twitch, the detectives. And, and Spawn is just kind of in the background every now and again, you know, nope, running across nope. rooftops. And I was like, no, nope. no, thanks. No, nope. that's not Spawn movie. Sorry about you. Just make another film. That's like that's like when they do prequels. I was uh, there. Well, I didn't realize that there was two spinoffs to Only Fools and Horses. Uh, yeah, there was the Rock and Chips or whatever Chips. it's called. Yeah, like a prequel. No yeah. interest in that. Got I watched slated. a bit of it. It's not funny. And then, no, um, yeah. what's his face? Uh, the car sales. The green, the green grass of home yeah, is supposed yeah. to be okay. The yeah. Brand. They don't have a four seasons. But sometimes, if you do a, a spin off or a recreation of something and you take out the main element yep. and just put it as a side character, I mean, the only time I've ever seen that work is Spartacus season two. Yeah, which is better. Very, very, which is better. Somehow yeah. worked. Yeah. Um, it's like, it, it's very hard to do. It's very hard to take out the main ingredient or something. The same way a band lead, lead, uh, lead singer dies or moves on to get that back. Real so, difficult. Yeah. Anyway, we've, we've gone off topic. Also. Yeah. Anyway, uh, who was your next one? That was Cypress Hill. Who's your next one? Speaking of uh, people that could only kind of do it really once and then try and catch that fire again. My second choice is Nas. Oh, famous uh, for it. Yeah. New York State of Mind. Back to New York again. Mm. New York State of Mind, 1994, uh, Queensbridge rapper. Uh, lyrically and musically, one of the most amazing songs, thanks yeah. to DJ Premier's production yeah. and Naz's lyrics and just flow for the whole mm. the delivery of the whole thing. The feel of that song is so, yeah. so perfect. So this is from his 1994 debut, Illmatic, which is a perfect album. Mm. And really kind of encapsulates a, sort of slightly more sunnier outdoor New York mm. sound as opposed to the dark laneways that you get with a lot of New York artists, specifically Wu-Tang and a few others yeah. that have that real dank, mm. dark sound. There's always a feeling of, you know, when you watch something like, I know it's set in Baltimore, but The Wire, it's yeah. always set outside on couches in these projects and stuff like that. The, the, Nas, it does sound typically New York, but it just seems, I don't know. Torn up to 11 almost. Something summary or something. Yeah, about it. I've been to Baltimore and it is like the wire. No messing. Oh really? Um, yeah, it's grim. It's grim. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he yeah. did. He, he, I think he, what he was going for in this is that, yeah, where we're living is grim and it's shit. Yeah. But like, we're still all all our pals are together and we're hanging out and we're enjoying that's, ourselves. Yeah, yeah, that's quite popular now. Actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag but, ad. But it does have a, le- a less basement feel to it. Yeah, uh, yeah. So he obviously had a huge beef with Jay Z, yeah. and they had some of the most exciting diss tracks, I think, um, between the two of them. They both kind of elevated their game for it as well, and they yeah. were, yeah. It's a shame that they, they it ended up like that. Mm. Jay Z kind of had his sights set on being the biggest, and he didn't want to, didn't give a shit really. What people really, thought. yeah, and he was sort of under him for a while, wasn't he? A proud of Jay, sort of. Uh, if I'm not I, mistaken. If I remember correctly, Nas. So Jay Z basically sold loads of drugs to become a famous rapper. He self financed himself completely. So yeah. he was he was shopping himself around as a rapper, and nobody was paying any attention. So he said, "Right, I'll just stop being a rapper for a year or two, and I sell all the drugs on earth." And he said this himself, like there's documentaries about it. I'll just keep selling drugs until I have enough money to like buy a studio and buy producers and buy uh, you know, CD press, not buy a plant, but pay for yeah. like, getting a million uh, CDs pressed and records pressed and the, the cost to promo to get these into radios and shit like that. Nas was in, Nas was part of a crew. And for the life of me, I cannot remember who else was in this crew. It was about 20 of them. And he got noticed while he was on stage. Uh, they gave him like a verse. In like uh, a couple of bars at a live gig, and it was recorded. Yeah. And someone went, "Jesus Christ!" It was about the um, Jesus. exactly. It was about the, Who is this kid? <laughs> it was about the Jesus Christ uh, come back and kill Jesus Christ lyric, and people went mad. Um, but like, who the fuck is your man? And then he just got signed, and he the, the amount of hype that was put underneath him was outrageous. But this yeah. album, like I said, lived up to it. Like, yeah, he hasn't really done another album like Illmatic. Mm-hmm. He's done some good stuff. He's done some great tracks since then. He's even hit albums that were pretty decent. But as far as I can really recall, there's nothing that comes close to nope. this one. No, nope. um, And it's caused the first one, it's much like DJ Shadow and a couple of other artists that we'll talk about later, put all the fire into this bottle. Big and time. We're glad they did. Like, yeah, he th- tried to come back so much. Like, I think he even made yeah. like Illmatic 2. 
you know, which you can't do that. Uh, no, it's just a and bad sign. There's a, there's a second part of this song on that, I think. Um, <sighs> the, like, this is uh, for me the best song on the album, and yes, it's not even a single again. Yeah, mental. Single. mental. So that was uh, Naz because he, yep. it'd be insane to not have him, have him in our absolutely, course, absolutely. Uh, who's your next one? My next one is kind of a combo effort, and it's Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg doing nothing but a G thing. Um, it's so good now. It's primarily uh, Dr. Dre song off the chronic from 1992, uh, yeah. but that album features Snoop Dogg an awful lot. It's pretty much people's introduction to Snoop, yeah. who had been taken under the wing of Dre. Um, you would have seen if you watch that Straight Outta Compton movie, you, they, they made a big song and dance about that connection. Um, about Snoop just kind of hanging out in the studio being somebody's cousin because Snoop Dogg is related to literally everybody on earth. <laughs> Yeah. And um, someone's he's like someone he's, else's cousin. Yeah. I think he's Dan he Dillinger's can, cousin. He, he was do, working. Like, the, the way you can do the six degrees of seven bacon, you can do that with family with Snoop. members with Snoop Dogg. Uh, absolutely, one hundred percent. I'm probably family. Yeah, me and you are probably related to him somewhere along yeah. the line. Um, I think he, I think he's he's Daz Dillinger's cousin or something like that. Who was one of the in-house producers for Death Row Records? Who put this out in 1992? Yeah, yeah. So this album, The Chronic, pretty much invented G Funk. And mm. G Funk, to be honest with you. I have a love hate relationship with G Funk. When it's done correctly, it's incredible. It's yeah. so good and it's so warm and lovely, but it's also hard hitting and grim at the same time. It's one of those it's weird, it's so yeah. good when it's done right. However, it's only been done right maybe 20 times. Like, yeah. And do you ever listen to like someone that gets a good hook for G Funk and then just does a crap rap and you're like, yeah, what a, what a waste. Or, or someone who just rides a sample into the ground. I mean, you had like the, oh, God, yeah. the, the dog pound who are one of kind of Snoop's gangs, essentially is, is crews that they, they done an awful lot of that stuff. And uh, rarely yeah. did it, did it ever hit, you know, um, Dre kind of stumped. There was other people doing something similar to G Funk. It was, it was only with Dre that it really got that name. Um, as far as I'm concerned, this is his debut album after leaving NWA and leaving Rootless Records. Uh, self-produced was Shug Noy as an executive producer. He was down as his ex- executive producer on everything that Row put out. Um, he was trying to make himself out to be obviously a lot more than he was. Uh, it's just a, a fucking henchman, essentially. Yeah. Yeah, uh, three time platinum as well, three million units sold. Um, uh, here's a good one. As of last year, which sounds weird to say, as of last year, 2020, this album has been deemed to be culturally significant and it's preserved in the Library of Congress. And there's not that many yeah, albums. Get that yeah, nod. A few albums are like that. Album. Yeah. yeah, it is hugely important. Interesting. Yeah. Um, why this album is important is this is 1992. There's an undercurrent of, of hip hop happening. You've got like a Troy Ball Quest stuff and all that. That's happening. But the people who are into hip, hip hop are the ones who are paying attention to that music. It hasn't penetrated really into white audiences or into kind of at, suburban at the, homes. At the almost request of those bands. Oh, yeah, They're pretty much. Happy, no interest. Happy with yeah. that. Yeah, 100%. And, yeah, absolutely happy making loads of money and not having their the deal forced, with yeah, for, garbage tours and, 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 their, and their tour having the. Forced five rows of white people kind of exactly. singing the lyrics. Oh, know. exactly. Yeah. Horrific. Exactly. <laughs> um, so uh, the, the only real popular hip hop at the time in the kind of early 90s, realistically, you were looking at stuff like Beastie Boys, which would have been kind of party hip hop, you know, Foy Fear Right and all that kind of bullshit. Yeah. Um, you would have had Vanilla Ice and MC Hammer, all that kind of stuff would have been pretty big as well. In terms of serious, like hard hip hop, there wasn't that much that was taken over the public's imagination until The Chronic came along, which is a big deal for, for obviously, Dr. Dre and for Death Row. Like this, was, this is the, 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 the kind of the ship that launched the thousand other ships off the back of Death Row. Um, yeah. if I, I, I have a feeling that if Chronic didn't deal as well as it done, there wouldn't be that many people talking about Death Row Records in general, to be honest with you. Um, there's just two albums that are talked about, one we'll get to later, um, from Death Row, realistically, two big ones uh, yeah. that are leagues ahead of everything else. I mean, you've got like this two pack stuff there and all that, but uh, compared to these other two, nothing, absolutely nothing. These two are yeah. um, uh, massive splashes on the radar. Uh, the reason this sounds different from anything else is that Dre had this idea in his head about how to try and mix kind of live instrumentation and old samples and use, you know, weird instruments like theremins and stuff like that, that nobody had heard 
in yeah. 30 years since like the Beach Boys and stuff like that, you know, like who the fuck's using Terramans? It's, it's not, it's not a thing. <laughs> but Dre has one and he's going to find out a way to use that on a, on a deadly flute sample. Like who the fuck is flute samples and stuff, you know? <laughs> so um, he, he took so, not necessarily took so long to make it. He kind of banged it out reasonably quick, but he knew exactly what he wanted to do. Uh, himself and because it was just him and he was able to bring kind of Snoop Dogg in and say listen you take this bar take the chorus I'll do this you do that and because uh, he was self-producing it and he was co-owner in Debt Row he's like alright um, just going to get to do whatever I want and they were able to put whatever money they wanted into advertising so you had like big billboards jumping up all over California in the ghetto and in white neighbourhoods as well so every knew it was coming so when it did hit it exploded now this song Nothing But A G Thing is a savage song like, I, I yeah. don't think, here's a weird one, and I get in trouble for this. I think The Chronic is a great album, but I think only half of it is good. I think there's yeah, a lot like, of filler. There is yeah. a lot of filler, and you, I, I didn't realise this till I got older, but there's a lot of filler, because you think as oh, a yeah. kid that every part of it is great, mm. but you start it to forget yeah. certain Oh, certain definitely. There's loads of, of stuff in there that's like, the fuck, I don't remember that. You know, because yeah. when you're a kid, I mean, realistically, you probably just fast forward and you're like, or skipping your CD. Well, you only had one album a month. Oh, exactly. <laughs> if you were lucky. Um, <laughs> but yeah. there, there was loads of this because I went back and listened to the, to the chronic kind of start to finish again there recently. I was like, Jesus Christ, that's it's all right. Like, it's OK. The, like, the, the highs are very high. Very high. But that makes the rest of it. Yeah. Kind of stink a little bit, unfortunately. Uh, anyway, that was Dr. Dre with Snoop Dogg. We're not with a G thing. Who is your next one? Well, we'll continue on with G Funk because uh, it's Snoop Dogg himself because he had to have his own place on this playlist, I think, to be perfectly honest with you. And I think the song that has to be done is G's and Hustlers. Oh, it's so good. Because I think this is genuinely the best song on the album. And again, yeah. not a single. Yeah. Not a Mental. single. Mental. Like, Snoop Dogg. Dog. It's so Absolute. good. Absolutely. Cl- that's classic, yeah. right? Yeah. Gin and Juice, classic. But I honestly think G's and Hustlers is... It's, it's the best. It's got the right pace. Yeah. The sample is outrageous. Like the hook is outrageous. Yeah. Um, it's brilliant. It, does, it never lets up. It's one of the best debut albums of all time. Yes. And this and the Chronic for me are the two top G Funk West Coast and the two top the two top uh, Death Row albums as well. You know, it's just, it, it, this is Interscope. That's Death Row yeah. as well, is it? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, this is 1993. So it's what year after Chronic? Yep. Um, and if you could only take two G Funk gangster rap albums, which you, you take this and the Chronic, I think. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Solid. Uh, again, this isn't isn't perfect, but it's so much fun. There's something about Snoop Dogg's style that it's always a bit more. You always think of Snoop Dogg in a more fun, friendly. Mm. He's like the guy at a party who was there literally to drink and smoke. Yeah, All exactly. Riding and fighting, maybe, but. <laughs> Literally, that's his favorite thing, and you always get a good sense of that comes out in the music. Like, and I'm not saying that he's harmless; he's absolutely not. Oh no, no. But but, but there's something about him that he just seems maybe because he pushed the smoking thing way harder than the rest of them. Yeah, I think so. And that that was almost his personality, wasn't it? Yeah, just smoking, and just smoking and stuff like that. And um, so the sample that you hear is from Bernard Wright's "Have a Globe Trapping." I said it right. Have a globe. Have a Glab Trublibin. <laughs> Habo Glabo Tribbin. Habo Glabo Tribbin. Mm. Habo Glabo Tribbin. There, I said it. Uh, so that is that makes up a huge part of the song, to be fair. Not just the music box sample at the start. Yeah. That's also from that song. Oh, really? Bing, 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 bing. Yeah. 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 And then it goes into that. So you can't give... I always thought that that's a great way to put one sample into here. They're both from the same song and they both come Very in cool. the same way as well. Yeah, because the whole thing so was produced uh, by Dre as well, wasn't it, the album? Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he took them and did it, yeah. Um, this, to me, is quintessential G-Funk. Like, it really is. It has that is their album, yeah. Yeah, it's 10 out of 10. And like, 100%. This song and your last one together, or even if you don't take the two albums, they make up the best part of G Funk, one hundred percent. Couldn't just have on a playlist of twelve to only have one G Funk song from the nineties. Come on, yeah. So, it's it, it's so. like I said. If that there's realistically a handful of really really solid G Funk songs, um, there's loads of ones that are, are are good and acceptable, but like killer tracks. Like there's one, there's one more to come. There's one more to come. We'll yeah. get to it later. 
But um, that's uh, that's my choice there. Who's your next one? My next one uh, had to do with it's Wu Tang with Cream. Yeah, had it's to my be favorite, as well. It's my favorite one, but in as well. Um, I don't think it's my favorite. It's up there. Uh, I think it's too slow for a Wu Tang song, but that's kind of the idea behind it as well. So uh, this is the second single. Uh, I, actually, there's kind of a dispute in the house whether it's the third or the second single um, of Enter the Wu Tang. I'm going to call it the second because I read more that it was the second single, and I read some that said it was the third. But we're going to we're going to say second. But uh, released January 1994. I think there was a version of this song doing the rounds in 1991. Um, they were messing with that had like extra verses and stuff like that now and i don't think i had the the chorus so apparently method man is really good at making choruses doing hooks so he was always the guy that raises like i don't i don't have it for a for a hook like i have the have the music there but i don't know what to do kind of lyrically or vocally nice. but method yeah. man is the guy that you just kind of pull him out of the out of the cupboard that's and go important. Like, yeah what, what what should we do here and he goes cash reels everything around me they're like what well, hang on just press record and off he goes and does it um so th- there's a big thing with with the Wu-Tang Clan because there was like nine members and then a lot of hangers on um at the start they didn't have any money so they were booked into really small studios a lot of the stuff was being uh kind of pre-produced in Riz's basement and being brought into studios to be uh, have vocals done and maybe to get kind of uh kind of ch- uh, tweaked up a little bit with semi-decent gear but their budget was so low that it doesn't sound particularly good so um that's where the the sound comes from that's why even after once you, you get into like wheel tank forever and yeah as you move on through the wheel tank kind of records none of them ever sound like this again like this is yeah. like like black sunday this is a, a a weird blip on the radar like all the stars aligned for this to sound like this and have these songs on there so yeah. because they couldn't fit all the people in the studio they could never really make songs where everybody was on them so th- yeah. there's no Wu Tang song um until the second album that has all the members doing anything on them so what uh, Rizzo used to do because Rizzo was kind of the de facto leader because he was the producer and he knew most about kind of sound engineering and stuff like that and he was also kind of ghostwriting for like uh, Dirty Old Bastard and stuff like that as well. He was helping him uh, write stuff. Uh, what he did was he'd make a battle against each other. He'd give them a little cassette and he'd say, with a song on it. And he'd say, right, come up with uh, come up with some bars and then I'll come over to your house and you show me what you came up with. So he'd essentially make them battle against each other. And whoever had the best verses was put on. So that's, that's cool. yeah, that's the way he worked it. So with this, he ended up with Raekwon, uh, Inspector Deck, and Method Man. Yeah, that's pretty much it. It's only three guys on this on this song, which is uh, amazing. But originally, it was called Lifestyles of the Mega Rich, um, because it didn't have that that hook that Method Man came up with. Yeah. Um, oh God, the hook is so good. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's really good. Dollar dollar bill, yo. It's exactly. Amazing. It's and and it lives on in infamy. Like it's their most famous Wu Tang song because it's their catchiest Wu Tang song. Like just the just the cream kind of slogan, which I'm sure they've been yeah. doing the rounds for years beforehand. Like this made it infamous, and it's still used to this day. Like, like give me. Uh, um, so this helped bring kind of New York to the forefront of hip hop again. This is 1993. Like I said, uh, the album comes out, but the single doesn't come out until 1994. So uh, you would have had, like you said, uh, Tribe Called Quest kind of got that big bump again. New York is back on the, it was invented in New York in the, in the late 70s, early 80s. Yeah. And it just it, it kind of dispersed amongst America. You had like hip hop groups popping up in, in Houston and in Atlanta and Chicago. And then obviously uh, the, the kind of whole L.A. thing happened as well. But this definitely helped bring New York back to the forefront of hip hop. It also changed the way records were made because there was always, even to this day, there's, there's still a thing. We're, we're, we're getting past it now, but there's still, there was always a thing about you can't make music unless you have access to a like killer studio. Like you, you consider the studio to be almost a participating member of, of, of the group, of the band. But Rizzo changed yeah. that. He just got enough gear that he could do 99% of it at home and when they did start getting some label interest, like there was even a thing where I, I think it was my music maker. And one of the, one of the magazines wanted to do a feature about Wu-Tang Clan and they were trying to get them all together for a photo shoot and they couldn't, <laughs> they, they just couldn't, they couldn't wrangle them together because the lads are still off fucking doing 
street stuff. Like they, they weren't making any money. They weren't <laughs> they were the Wu Tang clan, but they had jobs. You know what I mean? He's working today. Yeah, exactly. He's out. Like, and they couldn't get a hold of all these lads. So they ended up getting all these. They had a couple of photos, random photos of some of the lads, and like, but some of them were like wearing hoodies and shit like that. So they ended up just hiring this cartoonist to draw like a weird fucking cartoony drawn of the Wu-Tang Clan and that kind of became this real famous thing that's why uh, partially why the album cover looks like that we don't see any faces they've got hoods up on their faces are yeah. uh, have weird masks on them because at the start there was this uh, kind of mystique about the Wu-Tang Clan because there was so many of them they were like a gang and mm. nobody knew really what they looked like because they, they changed all their names none of them went by their real names they all had kind of monikers so this uh, music magazine who were writing an article about this upcoming album and this because uh, there was a single what was it fuck uh, there was a single released like a, a year or two before the album was even recorded that kind of got people to, to pay attention to it and then this cartoon comes out well these guys wearing like combats and hoodies over their heads and their faces are all blanked out and all of a sudden people are like who in the fuck are the Wu-Tang yeah. Clan like this is bananas <laughs> and then the album comes out and it's got that it's really dirty kind of shitty sound and real gritty and people well, are like Strike One did that on purpose didn't he <laughs> uh, he tried to match I believe he tried to kind of because he's working out his basement working off kind of old samplers and 808s and shit like that he had a real particular way of doing things and then he was adding in samples from all VHS tapes that had been played to death anyway because him and Ghostface were big uh, Kung Fu guys they, they love watching Kung Fu movies uh, Raekwon liked it as well so they had all these movies um, that they were constantly watching like Legend of Liquid Swords and all this kind of stuff and he ended up taking samples off those VHS tapes and they sounded gack so he just kind of made everything he kind of brought the fidelity down of the music a little bit so the samples wouldn't sound so so ill and it ended up working then because when you do hear the vocals that are done in a proper studio they're lovely and clean and they sound right but they're obviously being kind of filtered or EQ'd enough as well that they don't sound too polished sitting on top of this kind of dirty grimy um, and hack to get a music work, and it works it work incredibly whole, well. Like it's it does, it works for the whole view of it. It, it. it also means I don't think it could ever be remastered. Like if you ever see a remastered version of um Enter the Wheel yeah. Tang, I don't know whether I don't know whether it could be done because the source no. material is just not good to begin with. It needs um, to sound like that. Exactly. That's it's, it's supposed to sound like that. Anyway, that's Wheel Tang with cream um of uh, Enter the Wheel Tang, which is widely considered to be one of the greatest kind of debut albums in hip hop history. Yeah. Who was your next one? I just realized we've only gone New York and LA. That's really the, there's only one that's... there's only one or two differences on this playlist. Yeah. Where they're not from there. But um we're gonna go back to LA yep. and it's uh, one of the less obvious choices, but I don't think anybody will disagree that uh running by far side running by far side from mm-hmm. 1984 is has a place on this list for me anyway and um, this is another kind of entry for alternative hip-hop in a way mm. um they uh after the bizarre riot album they started touring with a uh, tribe called quest and de la soul so that's the company they were keeping it's that mm. kind of vibe um they did a lot of plows show in 94 with them and then this this song running is from the lab cab in california album mm. that's their second album that's uh produced by jay dilla which is sound it's why it sounds great it's, he's phenomenal it's bananas this, good this only peaked at number 55 in the billboard charts i always thought that this was much bigger in america no it is like a cult song it's classic, yeah yeah and uh, it even only got to 35 on the R&B chart. Mental. Um, it's not even their biggest single. This, the, the biggest single is Pass Me Boy, of course, mm. the one that sort of knows. And even then, that only got to number 52, uh, slightly higher. Yeah. They, uh, they are still together, but they haven't released an album in 16 years. They're That's doing mad shit. They, they put me off them there uh, last year, the year before. They, they, started, they started this little project with these bluegrass guys. Yeah. And it's them uh, doing doing like bluegrass versions of their songs and it's it's, it's despicable like it's fucking <laughs> it's honest, heard that. It's honestly know. despicable and they're, they're, uh, there's, there's footage of them doing it in a studio and like they can't remember their own lyrics they're reading their lyrics off their phones and stuff and uh, there's lads with like banjos like plinking like running or run doing the bluegrass type of shit in oh, the background no. oh yeah it's, no. it's honest to god it's disgraceful 
I, we've, talked about, me off. Like, we've talked about genres that we hate and that those bluegrass covers have come up a lot and uh, I don't yeah. want to hear a band doing that with them. Yeah, so it's it's just a fantastic song. As mm. soon as that hook comes in at the start, run it, run it. Yeah. Just the, the rap the rap isn't the best thing about it. I think it's the f- the feel of the song. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying they are incredible rappers, yeah. but they're not my favourites. But this song, anytime I hear it, I just go, shit. Yeah. Yeah. It's to, everyone loves this song. Like, everyone loves it. This is one of the ones I'd love to play a sample of because I don't think a lot... Some people will know it. Most, I, most I, think, I think a lot of them would know it without maybe even knowing that they know it. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, they'd hear it and go, I know that song. But talking about it doesn't make sense until you hear the song. But the, the, we're going to put the playlist out <laughs> yeah. um, the same day as the podcast so we people will, get to catch up. Yeah, we will. And um, just before we move on, a fun fact about Farside is the picture of Farside on the Wikipedia page is them playing in the village in Dublin. Oh, very cool. So there you go. Very it's not cool. much of a photo. Yeah. But that's just... Taken from the back. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Look, that's a that's not a bad album that Lab Cabin California. It's decent, yeah. I yeah. think I have that on vinyl yeah. somewhere. They they will be to me one of those bands that have songs rather than albums. Yeah, again, definitely. Definitely. I, I haven't listened to that in about ten years, so more. I, I think I listened to it last year. Just again, as with most things, there's there's killer stuff on it and there's garbage, you know. The the usual mix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well look, that's my choice for number four. Mm. Who's your next one? My next one is Mob Deep with Shook Ones Part 2. Oh, yeah. It's just bananas, yeah. It's outrageous. So this is the lead single from 1995. It's The Infamous, which is their second album. Uh, this, Mob Deep were always, to me anyway, Mob Deep were always this kind of mix of like Nas with Wu-Tang. They had this, another New York band uh, from Queensbridge, which a lot of fucking hip-hop acts come from. Um, in Queens, uh, it was it was a duo, Havoc and Pro- uh, Prodigy, formed in 1991, uh, originally called Poetical Prophets, which is an atrocious name. Thank God they changed their name. Uh, Poetical Prophets, God almighty. And uh, they weren't getting any, they weren't getting ahead um, under the moniker of Political Prophets. And they were handing out demos to everybody who paid attention. And one day they met Q-Tip from Tribe. And he was like, this is actually really good. And he introduced them to a, to a bunch of uh, record producers and executives and people involved in, in, in the kind of monetization of hip hop. And uh, originally they split them up. They gave Havoc uh, a contract and they gave Prodigy a, a contract and right. put out solo albums or at least done EPs or something like that. And I don't think they really done the business. So they got back together again, called themselves Mob Deep and released an album called Juvenile Hell, uh, which is actually pretty decent, to be fair. Um Juvenile has a, is a decent album, and then uh, in '95, the Infamous comes out. The Infamous is Jesus. I mean, it's probably on everybody's top twenty hip hop albums of all time because it's when it came out. Uh, Wu Tang had kind of been around for a couple of years. Uh, Nas had been around for a couple of years. Troy had been around for a couple of years, and uh, Q Tip helped them produce this album as well. So he was involved in the in the kind of mixing and cutting end of it. Uh, Havoc looked after most of the production, and Prodigy done most of the rapping. But they did kind of go back and forward. Um, they ended up getting in a row with Tupac. Really? Yeah, they got in a row co- kind of by accident, and. Uh, I think what had happened was that <laughs> someone had told Tupac that this group Mob Deep from uh, from New York were talking shit about him. So when he got out of jail, uh, he made the song "Hit Him Up." He referenced Mob Deep on it, and they were like, "Holy shit!" Like they didn't think they were anywhere near Tupac's level, so they didn't even respond to it. They were like, when anybody asked them, they were like, "Tupac." Shout us out on a record, like he done it negatively, but Tupac shouted us <laughs> out on a record. Like we're just gonna shut the fuck up and, and and sell some records off the back of this. Do you know what I mean? Uh, so they were they were they were kind of unfortunately caught in the middle of the the East Coast versus the West Coast feud. Um, they, they released a, they released a bunch of albums, uh, I think eight studio albums before Prodigy died. Uh, he died of. I need to look up his death because it's 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 fucking weird. I, this is the official cause of death: accidental choking, as a complication of hospitalization for sickle cell anemia. So that sounds like someone's wow. wasn't doing that job and he choked. That's what that sounds um, like. Unless 
they needed to like put something in through the throat or something intubation like that, or something maybe yeah, like accidental know. choking as a complication of hospitalization for sickle cell anemia um maybe i need i need to look it up i don't particularly want to look up uh how a fella fucking do it because Pro- prodigy was amazing but Hav- havoc said that he has an album ready to go um of stuff that they don't they had a big falling out as well uh, and they, they released solo albums later on in their life where they kind of dissed each other and then they realised, like, what the fuck are we doing? We're trying to sell albums off each other's backs by pretending like that there's a bigger beef between us than, than there was. Because I think Havoc <laughs> thought that Prodigy was lazy because Pro- I think Prodigy was put in jail and then he released like a cookbook of how to cook, how you make a dinner in jail and all this kind of shit. Like, and, um, yeah, <laughs> That's kind of funny. Yeah. <laughs> that probably wasn't meant to be, but yeah. Yeah, exactly. But I think Havoc was like, why aren't we doing music? Like, we need to keep making music. And Prodigy was yeah. doing other bits. I think he might have even done a bit of fucking acting. Uh, but uh, Shook <laughs> One's part two, it, it's called part two because it's a redo of a, a song of theirs called Shook Ones, obviously, where they kind of remixed and recut it and added, added some stuff in. And it's definitely uh, this and Survival of the Fittest are, are their two kind of big songs. Uh, fun fact as well at the start that they had a logo, which is like a dragon, um, it's a dragon logo. And uh, so do the hardcore band, Sick of It All, have the exact same yeah, logo. Um, and it's because there was uh, Sick of It All are from Queens, the same as Mob Deep. And it was a graffiti artist in Queens who used to do that dragon on down alleyways and shit like that. Um, so sick of it all, thought that's a really cool piece of graffiti. We're going to use that as our logo. And Mob Deep saw it and said, like, that's a really cool piece of graffiti. We're going to use that as their logo as well. Uh, so both of them uh, knew each other, both acts knew each other, and kind of done a handshake on it and said, well, we'll both use it then. Because the graffiti artist never stuck his hand up, I don't think, saying, like, that's mine. So they both used it. They actually got together. They'd done a really cool version of the Mob Deep song, Survival of the Fittest, with uh, sick of it all, doing the music. And yeah. their singer doing the chorus and the lads doing the, the verses rapping. It's a really cool version. It's really hard to find, but it's probably on YouTube if you're, if you're that bothered. You want to hear Mob Deep and Sick of It All doing a Mob Deep song. But anyway, that was Mob Deep, a Shook Wounds, part two. Who's your next one? My next one is um, the presence of probably the only female on the list. And it's in the form of the Fugees. Now, mm. before anyone starts having a big freak out, um, we had a whole episode dedicated to... Uh, the women of rap and we sort of used up some of the ones that would have been in here. Absolutely. Like Missy Elliott. Yes. Um, Soccer to me would have been on my list mm. here, but I've used it already. Exactly. Yeah. And I've used loads of it. Yeah. That whole like MC light might've been as well. Yeah. Um, so realistically, I don't know if that's fair, but I, it, it, it's, it's about as fair as there being zero men on that list. So exactly. Yeah. Whatever. Except uh, I think, we think uh, 50 mm. Cent is on your Little Kim track, which yeah. is a banger. Um, yeah, so just, it's just something to know. It's just something I noticed when I put it I was like, shit, normally we kind of, it just, we do still work things out naturally. Mm. But uh, go listen to that and then don't be annoying me. <laughs> the Fuji's <laughs> I have to cover myself here. But you know what it is? You know what annoys me, right? We do so many playlists with mm. so many different types of people. Why Spotify you know, doesn't even open anymore? There's that many playlists on it. And then, yeah, oh God, mine's in bits. Mm. Then someone will go, ah, you didn't put enough of this, this type of person on this list. Fuck like, off. We do, we do so much of everything. Yeah. Just because it's not on that one. It's not on that one. You can't level that at us anyway. So Jesus, because nearly two years of doing a podcast every single week, like <laughs> tens of yeah, thousands so, of songs probably. Relax. So just for, it, just, it just happened to know, I just happened to notice, but it's on my guy here. I was like, shit. Mm. Um, the whole Women of Rap was mostly 90s as well, by the way. So, yeah. Uh, so there you go. This is the Fugees. And, um, Ready or not from 1996. This is the moving away. This is New Jersey, mm. so it's close to New York, but not quite. Um, it uses an Enya sample, which we've talked about yes. before, because I think um, we've used the Fuji's a lot. I think Lauren Hill was on the Women of Rap podcast on our own, but I can't remember what we used. The Ready or not, this was this is oh, it's come up, it's come up in the fuck. Of course, I'm just talking about the actual thing. Mm. It came up on the ripped off. That's right. Yeah. Samples. That, that we're not going to clear mm. properly or whatever. And uh, we did talk about the fact that they didn't clear the sample with Enya first and Enya has taken them to court, um, mainly because I think the reason they didn't ask is either they thought, that's just some old singer from Ireland. Mm. No one's going to give a crap. The second will be, she's not going to say yeah because you course in the song. Yes. Um, and she's not mad into that at all. Whatever way, it, it got settled out of court anyway. It's all kind of... 
It's all okay now. Mm. <laughs> anyway, uh, the Ready or Not Here I Come, You Can't Hide sample comes from the Diphonic song off the same name. Um, a lot of artists come onto the scene with a serious backing from like a producer or other artist, mm. but I always feel like the Fugees came out of fucking nowhere. Nowhere, yeah. Just, just based on, and, and their their album before this uh, sold like twelve thousand copies. Yeah, it's now since sold ten thousand. Ah, yeah, which is still quite low because people wanted more after the score because the score is their second and final album. Yeah, it's like, mad, isn't it? Yeah. So Mental. some of the sign, some of the signs uh, that people might have saw that it was going to be the last album is the fact that when they were recording this song for the first time. Um, Lauren Hill came in and goes, "Look, I'm going to put this hook down, and then I'm, I'm out of the band. I don't really want to do it anymore. So we'll mm. just put down the, the reference song for Ready or Not." Mm. She came in, she broke down on multiple occasions, uh, emotionally, like while well, she mm. was just doing this part. So she went, "Look, uh, I can't do this anymore. I'm, I'm out, I'm leaving it." So they went, "Yeah, Grant, okay, whatever." Like mm. uh, apparently they, they seemed quite like, "Yeah, she seems in a bad way, mm. whatever." You wouldn't force someone to be in a band in a bad way. She came back five months later or so anyway, and the first thing she wanted to do was go back and do Ready or Not because she loved it. Mm. So she spent five hours in the recording booth trying to do the hook. Mm. And they just kept saying the same thing. It was like, the reference one was way better. <laughs> and it was probably because she was yeah, yeah. in a bad way that yeah, that probably. emotion sort of lent itself really well to it. And that's why that, like, the Ennius sample or else... I don't know if it's 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 a direct sample, but I think it also has her singing over. Lauren Hill singing over it a little bit as well, mm. um, just to kind of beef it up a bit. That's haunting. Oh yeah, when she amazing. starts singing that for the first time. It puts chills down your yeah. spine. It really does. Um, and let's be honest with you, Lauren Hill is is the main artist in that band. Like Praz and Wyclef, they're not on the same level at no. all. No, Wyclef tried near. to like drown people and content, and none of it really stuck. Well, a little bit of it did, yeah. but in a bad like, way. It's just one of those things where it worked. Like he suggested that the Delphonics track was used, you know, to sample and stuff like yeah. that. So he had a lot of input. I'm not huge, hugely knowledgeable about what Praz did in the band, apart from his bits, which were his, his raps on this are fine. Yeah. The, it's Wyclef's one's actually way better. Yeah. And Lauren Hill destroys them all because she does the hook as well. And exactly. So, she's so multi talented that uh, I think. They were just like they knew they had something very, very <laughs> special. Yeah. Or, but um this song went to number one in the UK, but not in America because it wasn't a single in America. Because the record label were very, very clever hmm. in not releasing this as a single so that people would buy the full album. Weird. Because they'd already released <gasps> um is it Fula Fula La La? Uji La. Uji La, yeah. Yeah. Um and they didn't want to do another single. They went, no, it's time to buy the album for this one. But in the UK, it was released a single. Yeah, yeah. Um, either way, big song. Were buying, like, that, were buying yeah. that album. Yeah. They were buying that album anyway. Um, Killer album. Six, six million in America alone. <sighs> and the video for this cost $1.3 million. Man, though. And uh, it's mad because... Th- just like a few months before this, the idea of them spending, having 1.3 million to spend on a video. Now, I know it works a bit differently. You mm. apply to the record label and they say, you've got this much. And they say, well, we want this much to do their thing. But it's mad, isn't it? Yeah. Like, it's like having a, I don't know. It is part of your your creative output, but it's, it's done by, I can't remember the director's name. God, I had it there and I forgot about it. Mm. But, uh, yeah, it has helicopters. It's fucking badass. It's a big deal. Yeah, I remember the, the video. For such a sort of muted song, yeah, it's great. Although by the end of it, they are talking about like I don't know. What well, I don't want Wyclef's be talking about. Half Who knows? To be perfectly honest with you, stealing money, money. stealing money. But, but <laughs> that song was about stealing money from the Haitian <laughs> government or whatever the fuck it was. <laughs> and then he, he's he's like he's the fucking Del Boy that night. Yeah, oh, big time, big time. Yeah. Well, his look, fucking dreadlocks must start at the back of his ears now, because the last <laughs> the last time I saw him, he was holding on for dear life. Yeah, <laughs> I don't. I don't mind Wyclef. I just think he's a bit silly. He's just. He, he's like a weird version, like the Baja Man or something. I like just every song was like a fucking rock around the clock type of fucking kind of uh, fun stupid thing. Uh, he had a song had, about. He had a song about being shot, and then he was shot. Yeah, yeah. I think Praz had one single that was actually really good. I can't remember what. Get out, superstar. Was. Yeah, you don't get a superstar. Yeah, that's Based actually a good song. Based on Islands in the Stream, and I really yeah, like it. Yeah, and it's not particularly 
great lyrics. No, people. it's just cheesy goodness. Like, <laughs> it's, it's perfect. Love, I love Islands in the Stream so yeah. much that, uh, that I love that. Um, anyway, look, that's the Fugees. Uh, couldn't, could not go without putting them on the list. Absolutely. Uh, one, of the best, one of the best albums again. And, mm. Like, have they reclaimed that glory? No, because they didn't write another album after. Mm. Lauren Hill did. A lot of people will say that the miseducation is much better than the score. Mm. Uh, not for me, but I can see. That, yeah, it's, even it's enough in my eyes, to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Who is your next one? My next one is Westside Connection with Bow Down. Um, right. This is probably one of the lesser known songs on this playlist. Uh, yeah, but at least we can't be seen as oh, very obvious. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, this, for me, is the ultimate... 90s kind of gangster rap song this this uh, it's not the most obvious gangster rap song and that it's not called i'm a gangster or something like that but it's this is for me if you looked up gangster rap in the dictionary there's a picture of the three lads from SI connection in this band and it's also a good excuse to get ice cube in there um i love ice cube dearly but i don't know what songs i would pick off from 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 Ice Cube to put on a best of nineties playlist. So I said, you know what? I'm gonna cover my yeah. bases and I'll cover three lads because Westside Connection was made up of Mac Ten, WC, and Ice Cube, and uh, this is their lead single off their debut album, which is also called Bow Down from 1996. So we're in we're mid nineties now. Uh, Westside Connection released two albums. Second one was called Terrorist Threats, came out in 2003, I think it was. Now here's both albums are very, very different. Very different. Bow Down is very much dark, grim, super ghetto, super hard, like lyrically super fucking rough. Like it's yeah. incredibly hard stuff. And the second one, Terrorist Threats from the early 2000s, I personally believe, and I'll be ostracized for this, I think that's a better album. I think the production on it is absolutely bananas good. The songs are fucking super. It's such a banger. Every track is a murderer. Like, there's not a single song on that second album that any other band, any other hip-hop group uh, putting out an album wouldn't kill to have any song off the album on their album. That, that's how good it is. Uh, but we're talking about Bow Down here. Bow Down, the lead single, is, like I said, the ultimate 90s gangster song it's just I don't even I don't know, know how to describe know it. it I probably know if I've ever heard it but it's been I mean, used in a couple of movies and stuff like they, they use it in uh, a lot of times they use it in like prison movies and shit like that when they're trying to set the scene for like a baddie you know what I mean it's just it's so hard it's so fucking good um, so Mac 10 left the band in 2005 uh, effectively ending the group they, uh, they they thought about restarting again a couple of years ago with uh, the game, they're going to bring the game in to, to just redo Westside Connection. But they also talk, talked about bringing the game at the NWA to to, uh, to do a reunion tour. And um, he seems to be the guy that everybody, because he's actually talented and he looks the part yeah. as well. He's hard as fuck. So he looked the part if you get me in. But the problem is he's like 20 odd years younger than the rest of the lads, if not more. So it just didn't work out. Now, WC and Ice Cube still collaborating songs all the time. Yeah, like Ice Cube will be on his album, he'll be on Ice Cube's album and stuff like that. But Mac Ten is just gone. He's just absolutely wants nothing to do with the group. I think I, I couldn't even tell you why he left. I don't know why. Really? Uh, I think he just had a row with the two lads. But um, it's a shame. Mac Ten's fucking super. He's a deadly rapper. Still puts out albums and stuff like that. Uh, a bit of a scumbag, but fucking a lot of people are. He's a he's a bit dort. Yeah, he's a bit dort. But I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, yeah. Keeping this it right album, today. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> this album, Bow Down, has an awful lot of uh, it's an awful lot of disses against Cypress Hill. There was a big Ice Cube Cypress Hill fight in the kind of what? early night, yeah, in the early I don't 90s. remember that at all. Yeah, Hearing they, about that, obviously, I don't remember it. <laughs> and uh, they, they ended up kind of squashing the beef because Moogs came on board and helped Ice Cube do the Predator and stuff like that, which is probably his best album, to be honest with you. And they did end up sorting out, but there was some sort of Cypress Hill beef between Ice Cube. And when Westway Connection got together, they just turned up to 11. So there's a bunch of Ice Cube, or, or sorry, a bunch of Cypress Hill disses. Uh, this song is actually, it's on GTA 5, Bow Down, as well. It's on GTA 5. Most, most of these are on GTA 5. Yeah, they're probably on there. I still haven't played GTA 5. Played the first 10 minutes of it and I turned it off. Brilliant. I just had to turn it off. I can't, I, I don't like driving cars. 
in games, and that that game is called Grand Theft Auto. Well, don't buy so, Cyberpunk then. Yeah, it's, it's an awful lot of driving, isn't it? If you, it's not. No, it's not a lot of driving. It's just so bad that when you press down on the yeah. accelerator, it's like, would you like to turn your wheels to instant ice? What? <laughs> what? Hard, you press it's the, the future. You press the yeah, but that's what you think. You press, yeah. you press the accelerator and the car slides to the left. You're like, what? Ah, fuck that. Um, so apparently it turns out. I think I might have talked about this before on another podcast that even if Westside Connection were to get back together again, they couldn't even use the name Westside Connection because mm-hmm. the second album, Terrorist Threats, was put out on Mac Ten's record label. So on paper, he owns the rights to the name and the logo and everything. So mm-hmm. uh, they would have to either change the name or they would have to pay him money. Or uh, ask him to rejoin. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that's going to happen, but I, I don't think they're going to ask him to uh, to give it up, and I don't think they're going to ask him to uh, to take a few bob or whatever. I don't think they're going to pay him to use the name. So if they were going to reuse it, uh, or re- or go back and do something like that, they'd call it something else, you know, just the yeah. connection or something like that. they come up with something else. Uh, that was best of the connection, Bow Down. Everybody go and listen to Bow Down. It's, it's a murderous song. <laughs> it's absolutely fucking outrageous. Uh, who's your next one? My next one is, it's arguable about who song should really be credited to, but it's, I'm going to go with Tupac okay. uh, for California Love. Oh, yeah. I know it's, it's, it's a half a Dre song and a half mm. a him song. It's mostly Dre, really, if you think about it. Yeah. But at the same time, though, I always associate the song with Tupac because it is, it was, it was shelved for a while to uh, be on The Chronic 2. Yeah, it was, it was a Dre song that he put aside, yeah. Yeah, but... Um, Look, if it didn't have Tupac on it, it wouldn't be as huge as it is. Exactly, yeah. This is a, a double A side from 1996, we're back to LA again, um, with How Do You Want It, which is another incredible Tupac mm. song. Like, absolutely, they're both bangers. Um, and it's the fourth single to be released after Tupac's uh, release from prison in 1995 and his fourth ever song with Death Row. Mm. The version I've picked now, we have to get into this now, is not the one we like. Exactly. It's the, that's, only one that's, it's yeah. the only one that's on Spotify for yeah. some man. It's really hard to find the, the proper version of it. I don't it's know on, why. But. I know it's on it's on the single, obviously, that I just mentioned. Yeah. And it's on um Tupac's greatest hits. Yeah. Not the one again, not the one on Spotify. Mm. The one on, actually the one on Spotify is another one called The Best of Tupac, and it's grayed out, so you can't even get that version. Exactly. So the version when you play this, you'll be like why What's does that this shit? Sound it starts going awry and then something goes wrong. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. So it has that um it has that uh sort of vocoder. Yeah. And then it's tzz, 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 tzz. Uh, yeah, yeah, bullshit. And then it goes into this really weird remix version of it. It, it makes it sound like that the good one was the remix because it's bouncier and more yeah. club like. Yeah. And this is the more like chilled out version of California mm. Love. Anyway, look, it's only there for posterity, which is the reason that it's at the end of the playlist. But just when you get to that, just go on YouTube and, and mm. listen to the regular one. So the original version contains, the one I like contains a sample from Joe Cocker's 1972 song, uh, Woman to Woman. That's right, it's yeah. really the crux of the whole yeah. original. Um, but that I original that, song, that Joe Cocker song is really good. It's brilliant, yeah. but you're at every given moment waiting for, Yeah. let me welcome everybody to the, to welcome, the wild, wild which West. is the best <laughs> intro. To, yeah. Is this considered a G-Funk song? It is. Mm, it? I don't know. Mm, I don't, it's more West Coast hip-hop. Yeah, it's more, it's, it's, I think it's, it's too sample-based to be, to be yeah, G-Funk. Yeah. So There's definitely an element of it in there because it's great. What, what I didn't know is it's the second rap song to use the Joe Cocker thing. This is 1988, the Ultramatic Ultra Magnetic MCs, MCs yeah, cool used it on a song called Funky, yeah, yeah. So I went back to listen to that again today, and I was like, "Shit, this could be like it could be as good." Yeah, it's not though. It's not Ultra Magnetic MC is first album is super, um, but yeah. it's it's it, it's kind of dated, especially when you. It's very even the look of it, like there. Yeah, the even when you when you look at what Kill Keith has done since. Like it's 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 leagues ahead, like leagues ahead. And um, so I was waiting for like the it's not it's 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 grand, but it's still the best song that this sample is on, including the original. So yeah, I'm happy enough for it to take that much from a song if it's the best, and it is. So this was written in uh, Dr. Dre's studio home. Yeah. And Tupac came in and he wrote the verse in 15 minutes. Yeah. He was famous for that. Just God, yeah. he was so good at that. 
banging it out. And that's why yeah. he has so much material because exactly. he never got still stuck. banging them out. Cunt's dead fucking still years. Still banging them out. Yeah. And there's still albums coming out. <laughs> They're all shy. Like, uh, remember Eminem got a hold of a lot of his uh, kind of acapella stuff and just Eminem can't produce to save his fucking life and threw a lot well, of dirt behind it. If Eminem it. could write and produce music, he'd, he'd be... Well, I don't know, some people still consider him to be the best rapper in the world. Uh, he's very he's, good, but... He's very good and he's back to being very good yes. as well. But, like, that Godzilla is something to get here from, like, mid, mid-2000s. Yeah. From him, you know? Exactly. And the reason Eminem isn't honest, of course, is because it was... <laughs> January 2000 yeah when he started kicking off so it'd be pointless to be putting like his whatever what what was his name before this Bunny Rabbit or something like that. Uh, or is that just, I that think no, that was just a film that was just in the film it was yeah. always M&M. he, he was like the letter M plus M he wasn't yeah E-N-E-M. so I'm not going to go over that pretending that, that I, I was listening to that in the 90s no one was uh, no I, I, had, I had I had Infinite his first album um, but I only got that around the time that his oh, his oh, proper album came out that was getting leaked left right and center and it's not very only good. people only people in Detroit had that absolutely so uh, California Love yeah it's slightly annoying and it's the only sort of bad patch on the playlist is that it's not the version I want I know that the, hurts but it has it to be talked to, about it has to be talked about as yeah. one of the best hip hop songs of the 90s if it ever um, arrives on Spotify we can go back and change it exactly yeah and we can uh, I'd love to know why it's so hard to find. I have a copy of it on like a bootleg LP. I have one of these yeah, like, the, DJ party you, LP is like. But you have, you have a mad, no. Oh yeah, you've got, how do you want it on like a separate single? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I have that on, on yeah. 12 inch. That was a, that was That's a right. debt row. They were reissues they done. Jesus, in like 2001, 2002. HMV had an exclusive license to sell these weird debt row. 12 inch singles. I, I remember oh, no. when uh, when I wanted to um, play that on our hip hop night that we did mm. with Just Vinyl, you were like, oh, yeah, I've got that on single. Like, and I came in the day all pissed off, I couldn't find it anywhere. When I was like, oh, I've got that there. Do you want to play it? I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, how do you want it? Was, was a strong contender to go ahead? It's simply because yeah. of that. Like, Come on. You know that it's this song. It's it's California Love. You yeah. have one more left, don't you? I have one more left. The last one, I believe, I think. Yeah. Give it to oh me. God! Right, suck this it a, to me. This is suck it to me. This is a big one for me. This is Ice T with OG Original Gangster. Um, Ice T is probably the reason that I like hip hop as much as I like hip hop. Uh, I don't remember how I got into Ice T. I couldn't tell you. I think it was around the time I definitely was listening to Ice T before Body Count. I remember that because I remember Body Count being. Uh, a thing when someone said it's Jamon the rapper Ice T and I was like I like him um, it could have been like fucking that film Ricochet or Colours or something like that that I heard I heard a track on I was like what the fuck and I went out and bought, bought a bunch of stuff I bought Power and Six in the Morning and all that kind of shit um, I love Ice T I absolutely adore Ice T I love the early squeaky voice 80s kind of tick tacky fucking tick 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 yeah I, I love all that stuff as well. I don't love it as much as I love Home Invasion and the album OG, but uh, Home Invasion and OG are uh, uh, Seven Deadly Sins are great albums as well, but this song they're OG... 80s, they? No, they're all 90s. Oh, right. Um, <laughs> this song OG Original Gangster is probably... It'd be one of his most famous kind of rap songs, I would say, uh, aside from maybe Six in the Morning and Colours, which are Six in the Morning has a different appeal to it than anything else. But in terms of the kind of 90s hip-hop, OG Original Gangster, the, the album came out in uh, 1991. It was his fourth album. Um, yeah, it was de- it was definitely Home Invasion or OG, I think, that I heard him properly forced. Because I'd heard like that that shit film Ricochet, with, I think it was like Mario Van Peebles or something like that. Was yeah, in it was. It. And uh, he'd done the soundtrack for it. He'd done a song called Ricochet. It was actually a good song. And... Uh, so just like a double album uh, 24 tracks the CD version has 24 tracks the LP version has 16 tracks LP version real hard to find I have a I have a version of it uh, what is it how would you even describe it I have Ice T's personal copy of that album that he used on his European tour for that album so when they were touring Europe in like 1992 uh, they would have had like 20 copies of the album that were 
it was a, it's a double LP, but it didn't, doesn't have all the songs of the album on it. It only has the songs from the album that they're going to play live. And it's got yeah. on one one of the records has the full songs with the vocals and all that kind of shit. And on another uh, record, they're blank. They're just instrumentals for the DJ to play and scratch while Ice-T is rapping. I have one of those. Um, I got it off a mate of mine who's a promoter involved oh, right. in when Ice-T played over here in like 1992. And it was just sitting in his collection. He knew I was a mad Ice-T fan. And I knew... Yeah. Trying to find, uh, trying to find OG on vinyl is kind of difficult. I think it might have been reissued a couple of years ago, but still hard to find. Uh, so 24 versions of the CD, uh, 16 on the LP, dub and album. This song actually has a sample, a uh, Tin Lizzy sample on it. Um, oh, yeah, uh, Johnny the Fox meets Jimmy the Weed is uh, one of the main samples on, on OG. Uh, he had, he done a bunch of stuff, Ice T, but I'm not going to lie to you. I don't know if any of it was good. He, he had this kind of crew called Rhyme Syndicate, and that's what he called his little imprint record label again. It's was, yeah, was not a great name. Yeah, it's, it's not a good name, and it's not... That Rhyme Syndicate album is... Mad hip-hop purists go fucking lula for the Rhyme Syndicate album. They love it. I don't hear it on there that makes me want to listen to it on, on the reg at all. But I listen to OG all the fucking time, the album. I listen to it all the time. It does some fucking killer stuff. Like the, I think the best ever Ice-T song is The Tower, and The Tower's on there. Uh, but it's not. It doesn't really sound nineties ish. It, it doesn't even sound like. I don't know how to describe it. It's real haunting, kind of almost mid Eminem era stuff. It's real ghostly and spooky. It, it's fucking amazing. Um, yeah, I only found this out the other day. So I, I knew his real name was Tracy, but his full name is Tracy Lauren Marrow. Sounds like a porn star. Tracy Lauren Marrow is his name. Born in nineteen fifty eight. He's getting on. Uh, Ice Tea. Uh, I follow him on Instagram and he's very funny. He's very funny. <laughs> All he does is play Call of Duty on Xbox and uh, slag people and dress up like a pimp. He just dresses so, up randomly, so, just, like, puts the hat on sounds, and the cane. Some of that sounds like me. Some of that sounds like you, exactly. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, I had to put Ice Tea in there. It's just if Ice Cube was getting his, his leg in, I think Ice Tea had to get his, get his leg in as well. <laughs> uh, that's a good but, list. That's that's a, I listened to this playlist yesterday when I was washing the dishes and it was, it's murderous that's a solid play. I don't know if we've tracked it as well as we could have but I think it's fine there's some great track stuff on there yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, and cool. again it's just an example of a lot of really good 90s hip hop uh, we will do a volume 2 at some stage because you could do volume up to 100 on this Like as I said Jesus, this yeah. to me is one of the greatest runs in, in music history is, is 90s hip hop uh yeah, it's, it never it, it has ascended those heights it's 10 times more popular now than it was back in the 90s but I don't think it's as good so well I don't know if it's as popular in terms of like <laughs> I'm not selling 6 million copies but in terms of how in terms of how it's seen in the public psyche yeah yeah, yeah. yeah it is good. absolutely uh, anyway that's it for this week yeah. we are back uh, are we doing radio this Saturday I think we are we yeah, we're back for radio. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we will talk to you live Saturday night. Uh, get your cans in the fridge, or take them out and have drink them warm like me. And <laughs> <laughs> I have a wait. Till you hear this noise? That's a big old slab of a uh, curling cans that I got stuck into last night, and I'm going to leave them up here in the heat, and and they'll be lovely now by next Saturday. Will it be warm actually up there? Oh yeah, yeah. So heating's on. Like I mean, turn the heating to... off in that room. No oh. man, I want me. I want my cans warm. I want my cans warm. I want them at really? room temperature. Your body absorbs them better then. Um, <laughs> what does that mean? I don't know. It gets into you quicker, doesn't it? Man, like, uh, I like curling, but the only way I can drink curling is if it's ice cold. cold. Yeah, I was talking about this last night. Curling to me is like the best pissy Brit beer. Oh, it is, yeah. You know what I mean? The last thing is people always say to me, no, that's still at our throat. I'm like, that's not a pissy beer. That's yeah, and, and, it's not, beer. and it's not English. It's fucking Belgian. Um, yeah. And it, well, but that's up there. Carling is the war is the like best worst beer. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. The best easily available PC English beer. Uh Tenants is nice, but it's too sweet. Um it's too sweet. Carlin is it's only four percent. I might try it. I might try Tenants of a sweet. I like it all sweet beer now. Oh yeah, t- Tenants is very sweet for a lager like. As very... as you can tell from my songs, I like West Coast. I like West Coast IPAs and West Coast <laughs> yeah, There you go. Uh, anyway, we're back on Saturday with a radio show. We're back the Monday after. We have an idea for a podcast that's gonna be killer. And um, <laughs> uh, if we do it right, it'll be 
fun and grim at the same time. But uh, if you like what yeah. we do, we got the patreon.com forward slash the lost art podcast. If you want to tip us, you got the kofi.com forward slash lost art podcast and all of the links and all the podcasts and all the nonsense are up on lost art podcast.com. And it we doesn't will see go you. unnoticed and we appreciate it. It, yeah. it makes a big difference. I, I can only afford one slab of carling this week. So uh, <laughs> that's bad. Yeah, that's that's not it's not expensive. So um <laughs> uh, p- power up your patreon.com and power up your Kofi and uh make sure make sure we're minded and we'll keep you in music and shy talk uh, for the foreseeable yes. future. Uh back next week. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night.